everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, our guest is uh, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, please, uh, sir, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I'm a geologist and an attorney. Um, I live in San Clemente, California. Um, the name of my company is Geolaw, and it's very much a hybrid between geology and law. Yes, this is exactly what I found so interesting about what you do, sir. Because very often we find ourselves in a situation where we take things for granted, where we assume that houses are built this way and there's no other way to build them. And the same goes for the water supply rules and everything else that goes into the complicated infrastructures and laws that govern it. So can you please help us understand how um, geological data about our environment is communicated to our daily lives? It's, it's tricky because a lot of people, they don't really understand geology. Um, you know, it's a science based on observation and there are some pretty simple rules about how um, the earth has, you know, evolved over time. And when you see it, when you see a rock formation, you can learn a lot about, you know, what's it composed of and how strong is it and how is it suitable for development um you know and same thing goes on the water side you know um, you have to understand the geology to understand if there's is a water supply in a, in, a, in an aquifer um so you have to you know, always have to characterize the geology so that you can incorporate the the science into design and permitting and, and that's you know so the geology is one half of things and the permit law and then here in california to get things done it can be very difficult to get get projects approved these days there's so many environmental rules so i hope i answered that mm -hmm. uh what would be your opinion do we need fewer rules or do we need more rules and regulations how do you see um probably fewer rules, probably fewer rules. Um, especially in California, it's gotten so expensive, you know, to, to do anything. Um, and that's a product of a lot, a lot of the rules, you know, there's a lot of, say you want to develop a home, you know, on the coast. Um, you've got to deal with the local city, you've got to deal with the county, you got to deal with the the water district, you got to deal with the coastal commission and you can spend a lot of money and waste a lot of time and get nothing, especially along the coast. Um, it's very highly regulated if you want to develop along the coast. Mm -hmm. And are there any laws that are, in your opinion, outdated that are no longer necessary? <clears throat> um, Nothing comes, nothing off the top of my head, you know, you know, I think, you know, the process works pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. It just could be less cumbersome. And, and if the people in government were more clear about what you can and can't do um, in the beginning, it would save people a lot of, a lot of time and money. Sometimes you can get down the road and you'll, you know, you think you're getting close to an approval and you know it could be it could be one person you know um see here we have cities and, and we have city councils and the city council is in charge of the you know you, ha you have the mayor of the of the city who's part of the city council and typically the city council is made up of five people sometimes it's seven and it can get very political sometimes the city councils don't they don't really listen to the science Sometimes they're motivated by, you know, other, other motives and, you know, and, and the city council is made up of school teachers and accountants and lawyers and just, to, you know, that don't have any background, you know, in the geology or they, or they might just be purely politically motivated. You know, here we have mostly the democratic party and then the Republican party, people will split right down that line it, just because of that. You know, um, 
And so you have to be really good at uh, lobbying. And that's part of what I do too, is to try to try to get at least three of the five people on your side. Cause that's what you need, you know? And a lot of times it's three and two, you know, there's all, there's a lot of times there's a three, two split. And if they're, if they're three, two in favor of, you know, what you want to do, that's good. But if it's three, two against you, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter what the science is. I mean, you could sue. So if they make a bad decision, you could sue the city and then be in a court of law and have the judge decide whether the city abused its power or not. So that's, that's a part of what I do as well. Um, I, I filed quite a few lawsuits against cities um, for them abusing their, their discretion or not following the law. And a lot of times, you know, we, we've won a lot of those. So. Can you give an example? So something that you really like the case? Um, for example, like if you're if someone, say a client was developing on the coast and the city or the coastal commission wanted to make them push their, push the house, you know, back really far from the coast edge, farther than it maybe needs to be based on the geology. Um, that's called a taking. That's like where they're, they're basically taking, you know, they're not letting you use your property in the manner. So um, I've had a number of those types of lawsuits where, you know, we got to sue them. We get into court, we explain the law to the judge. The judge realizes that they were being, you know, overly, uh, you know, complicated. And, mm -hmm. and so that'd be one example. Another example would be suing a city or a water district over their, the amount of money that they charge for the, to deliver the water to your, to your home. Um, in California, there's something called Prop 218, Proposition 218. And that basically says that cities and water districts cannot um, make a profit on selling water. So it's a basic essential need. They can charge for the cost of service, you know, the treatment of the water and the delivery of the water, you know, whatever that cost is, but it's typically a uniform cost. And what, what they've done in recent years is they've tiered the rates so that the, the more you use, the, the more you pay. And the cost of the water often is, is doesn't, there's no, there's no additional cost to the water. Every unit, every unit is the same cost. Mm -hmm. So it's illegal for them to be, to charge, you know, inclining rates when there's really just one cost of service. They were charging more for each additional unit of the water. Unit. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yeah. When, when each additional unit doesn't cost them anymore. Sure. So it's, it's basically a way they, you know, a lot of cities and water districts, uh, the employees have what's called a pension, which is when you retire, you basically keep your salary. Um, and the pension system is kind of broken here in California. Um, they don't have the money, you know, to keep affording the pension. So they're, you know, they go in the, into debt on that and the tiered water rates, you know, are one way that they've, they've used to try to generate to pay pens. You know, you can only, you can only chop, you know, the revenue has to come from the water service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That's something that I bet not very many people think about. And yeah. it's the case where you really have to understand the geology side of things and also the social situations of the place that you're currently located that's what right. makes it very interesting when i found out that your company you work as far as i understand not only in california but you have some um stations elsewhere i was wondering how you managed to process all that very specific and niche data from so many places how's that possible um, well, on the legal side, there are some really powerful websites. One of them is called Westlaw. 
One of them is called Lexus Nexus. It, it has every, every statute, every case, every decision that's, you know, and so you can, you can just do like a, almost like a Google search term and you can find the law that you're looking for to support your case. And then as far as the geology goes, you just have to do a site investigation, you know, of that site of each, each unique site. And you put the facts and the law together, science and the law together. Yeah. What are the biggest categories of um, laws that you work with on a day-to-day basis? Well, for me, um, it's mostly land use laws, you know, that restrict, that regulate, you know, how you can use property, um, water laws, you know, how, the laws, ref- you know, that reflect ownership in water. And there's different types of water. There's water that's, that is in streams. There's water that's in aquifers under the ground. There's storm water. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of different types of rules depending on, uh, and then of course there's laws about whether they, they, the main law is with water is if you have, if you have a property that, oh, oh, you know, directly overlies an aquifer, you're, you're able to, you know, access that water. You can't like drill down at a slant you know, well, you can sometimes, uh, it gets tricky, but there are basically you have to be an overlying owner to have water rights. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, then there's laws about construction and construction claims, you know, um, when a construction, you know, there, there can be contract, uh, laws, you know, about, about how, how to interpret contracts. There can be, there are laws about, you know, when there's a construction project that goes wrong and there's, there's defects there that's called construction defect law. Hmm. Then there's laws about real estate and purchase and sale of, of property. That's a whole nother separate type of law. So there's, you know, there's about five or six areas of law that I deal with. Um, some, you know, they're all unique, but there's a little bit of crossover. Hmm. That's interesting. And do you use any skills other than pure geology and law skills, something that you learned in school? Or was there something that you had to learn um, on your own that wasn't part of the traditional curriculum? Yeah, no, in, in law school, well, everything you, you, I learned in college and grad school about geology, um, that applies you know, directly into being a geologist and doing that type of work. On the law side, they, they don't really teach you how to be a lawyer in law school. They teach you, really? yeah, you teach you how to think and analyze cases and, and learn the law, but then you really don't learn anything about actually being a lawyer. And, and, wow. and yeah, it's, it, so you, you kind of learn on the job. You know, you have to learn, you know, there's so many different types of documents and briefs and, you know, that you file and, and there's, you just, you know, Fortunately, I had pretty good mentors, you know, my bosses were really good. And so I learned from some good people and that's, you know, some people start out and they go on their own. It's called, uh, hanging a shingle, hanging a shingle. <laughs> and, you know, they just learn how to do it. You you know, if, if you're smart, you can get on and you can find out a lot just about with people. You can figure out what you're looking for. And there are all kinds of forms and practice guides too. You know, so you can buy these professional practice guides and they tell you, you know, they're very helpful. And then if you have a good secretary or, or assistant or paralegal, that's very helpful. You know, someone that, yeah. So it's nice to have help. <laughs> of course. In any yeah. job for that matter. Yeah. Um, yes. And since we're hard pressed for time. I'll ask probably the question that I found most interesting about this intersection between geology and law what is the degree of flexibility and adaptation that the laws have to current environmental problems for example if there's a report that says you know there are problems there are going to be more floods or more extreme weather events for example related to climate change is there any active response that 
the legal or the policy system has in store for that? Yeah, here in California, um, climate change is a big deal, especially if you want to develop along the coast, because now the Coastal Commission is taking these worst case scenarios of say seven to 10 feet of sea level rise um, over the next 50 to 100 years. And um, that's pretty extreme. We have a tidal gauge in La Jolla, Cal in San Diego, and it's on the pier at Scripps, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It's a world famous, um, it's part of the University of California, San Diego. And it's a world famous Institute of Oceanography. A lot of smart people down there. They've been monitoring sea level rise on the, on the pier with the, with the gauge for 120 years. And they've seen a very steady, steady, steady rise in sea level, but it's not, it's not doing that. It's not an exponential curve. Like, like a lot of, see, a lot of people just don't want people to develop on the coast anymore. So they, they use sea level rise as a tactic to basically, to basically ruin your project. Really? Why Sorry. It's political. It's political. It's, you know, because, you know, most Democrats, you know, believe more strongly in the environment and they, you know, they, they just want to see the coast more open up rather than developed with homes. And then, you know, more Republican conservative minded people, they're more property rights based. So, you know, and typically wealthier in a lot of areas, like a lot of areas on the coast are very Republican. Um, and so it's just political and, but it's frustrating for me because, you know, yes, sea level rise is real, but it's only, it's only going, you know, 2.2 millimeters a year. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, and it's, and we've been talking about sea level rise for decades now and climate change for decades. And everybody keeps saying it's going to do this, you know, it's an exponential and it's, just, but that's not what's happening. And, you know, I've, I've tried to argue that so many times and, you know, the, the government has just decided they're going to go with worst case scenario. And so you have to basically account for seven to 10 feet of sea level rise and factor that into your slope stability and wave attack analysis. And when you, when you have to do that, it really makes, it can, it can, it can make you push your, your, your prop, your, your home or whatever you're building have to push it back so far that you just can't build anything on your property. And so, yeah, it's a mess. Wow, I've had a huge takeaway from just this interview because I never thought it was um, that subjective in a sort of way. I thought it was more, you know, there's this factual data related to geology, then there are the resources available for building, for example, and project ideas, and then you find the perfect balance between the two. But you actually yeah. have to uh, integrate that with the opinions, with of different and the biases of people. I mean, we all have biases, but uh, yeah. the social aspect of uh, of the job that absolutely fascinates me. Okay. Well, Thank you for all yeah. your answers. I like your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs>